Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We gather together to act the Lord's blessing. He chastens and hastens His will to make known the wicked oppressing He's from distressing. Sing praises to His name. He forget not His own. Beside us to guide us, our God with us joining, ordaining, maintaining His kingdom divine. So from the beginning, the fight we were winning, the Lord was at our side, all glory be thine. We all do extol thee, thou Lord, for our young and pray that thy defender will be. Let thy congregation in the tribulation. Thy name be ever prayed, O Lord, make us free. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let us all bar heads in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time, Lord, where we can come and bring our sacrifices of praise and just gives you thanksgiving lord as you have taught us that to be thankful for all things for you has given have given us lord so lord god we just ask a blessing on this service lord let your will be done and touch those that can't be with us this morning lord um, we just pray that um, there'll be healing deliverance but most of all lord god let your presence be known, that they may feel your presence and enjoy today, Lord, as this is a gift from you, Lord, as we thank you this morning. Just give you all glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all join together in singing America the Beautiful. to pray for Josephine Reyes family. She needs a miracle this morning and we're looking to God and as we're celebrating Thanksgiving with our families, let's remember the Reyes family at this time. God is still a God of miracles. Carol reminded me that years ago she was in a similar situation in a coma for a, a month and God raised her up and so God is still able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. So let's put our faith together and ask God to be the God that can give us a miracle for Auntie Joe, 
and be with the family to comfort them. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are praising you for this glorious Thanksgiving. We have many things to be thankful for, and we lift your name, and we lift up Auntie Jo, Lord, and we ask, Father, that the word that is in her will come alive. We speak life to her. We bind the spirit of death and disease in Jesus' name. We rebuke every evil spirit in that hospital room. We pray for wisdom for the doctors and the nurses. We thank you, Father, because you are the great orchestrator. We put our trust and faith in you. We pray that she will know and feel your presence, that the word that is in her will come alive to minister to her, and we pray for comfort and strength for the family. We ask, Lord, that you be with them in a very special way. We give thanks to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Smile at somebody. We're going to have a wonderful service this morning. And if you're gathered with your family and you're going to have your Thanksgiving dinner after the service, I pray that everything will be still around you, that wherever you are, that your space, you will give it to the Lord and make it a holy space so that his presence can feel comfortable. So let's worship the Lord with all of our hearts. Aren't we thankful that we're here worshiping the Lord together this Thanksgiving day? Let's worship him. Amen. I will enter his gates with the kingdom in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord had made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord had made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. We bring sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you sacrifices of thanksgiving and we offer up to you the sacrifices of joy we bring sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord we bring sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord and we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving. And we offer up to you the sacrifices of joy. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name. O Most High, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name. O Most High, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. To show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness at night. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. To, to sing praises unto thy name, O Most. 
most high. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name. Oh, most high. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name. O Most High, who show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness at night. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name. O Most High. Hallelujah. We certainly have so much to be thankful for this Thanksgiving. It's been a rather difficult year. Things have changed, but we have adjusted. And I pray that Jesus is still on the throne of your life, and I know that if he is, he's doing wonderful things for you. At this time, we're going to receive our love offering, and usually our Thanksgiving offering is given away to a mission field need, or somebody else in need, or some ministry in need. But this year, we thought, and I think all of you here will agree, that we're going to give a special love offering to one who we've come to love very much and who's helped a lot and who has come to the Lord during this year. She has been like my right hand. She's the energy that I need in my old age, and I'm the wisdom she needs for her young age. We get along really great, and I have kind of adopted her as my daughter, and so she's been, you know, I didn't want to lose her, so I said, if I adopt you, then you cannot run away, but uh, I know she doesn't want to run away, but you know that Carol has been a blessing to us. She came at the right time, it seems, when um, the pandemic was just about to start, and she had... Uh, her job had, uh, because of the need, I guess, of the family or the different changes, she was a caregiver. She was looking for a job, and we were looking for somebody to help us. We could not pay her at this time on, and put her on salary, and she understood that, but we tried to provide for her everyday needs and, and be fair with her. But, you know, at the beginning of this, when she came to work with us, and she didn't need a job assignment, in fact, her job assignment for me is don't be a flood, be a river. Because she was volunteering for everything and wanting to learn anything. I think she's in training to be a pastor's wife. And so we're going to pray for that anyway. But uh, she worked, and I have worked by faith. I live by faith, like I said the other night in our uh, lesson, I guess it was last night, that we all should be living by faith. And... I learned early on in my ministry this, the Lord taught me, that he will supply all my needs. And if I would do for him joyfully what I can do, he will do for me what I cannot do for myself. And I know that miracles have unfolded in her life, and she saw that her monthly provisions were taken care of. And many of you have been very generous in just giving her a love offering without me even knowing, and I appreciate that. But today's love offering will go to Carol. And uh, I know some of you are at home, and some of you have not been to church because of the pandemic. We had opened a Facebook account or or whatever you call it, to have our programs done. And on it, we put a place where you can send in your offerings through the Facebook page. However, we ran out of, into some kind of complication, so now our services are run under my name. And uh, so if you want to watch the services, you have to Google my famous name now. But uh, if you'd like to give an online donation then you can go back to our Faith in Jesus uh, account and you will see a place where you can do it by that or you can send it in by mail to our address at 432 Waehu Beach Road, Wailuku 96793. And I say this especially to our own church members. We really believe 
in honoring the Lord with our tithes and offerings. And every time we make an appeal, we ask you to only give what God lays on your heart. And so do it in obedience to the Lord. Don't do it because you feel sorry for her, because she cannot repay you. But you do it unto the Lord. And the Lord will use it to multiply it for her needs to be met. But he will bless you because of your obedience. I'm going to ask Carol to come up at this time. And uh, I'm going to ask Howard, our deacon, our elder board, wanted to do this for her. She's going to say, he's going to say a blessing over her. And I know that we're going to see God bless her exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think because God is faithful to his word. I've seen her work cheerfully, doing everything she can from cleaning the bathrooms, sanitizing this place every time for service. I'm trying to teach her to form committees and let some things go because sometimes I think she feels like she has to do it all by herself and I don't want her to be worn out and I don't want to have to care give my caregiver. So I'm kind of doing it for a selfish reason, okay. But I know that you love her. God loves her, God sent her to us and she's been a blessing not only in doing the physical work, but during the pandemic when it started and I started this Facebook ministry which I never wanted to do, I never wanted to be out in the public like that. But God dealt with my pride, and as soon as we had a shutdown, I felt like without even having to consult God that I needed as pastor to connect with you. And we started a half an hour every night, prayer and devotion time, just to be connected with you. And then it evolved into something else. And through her influence, God has led her, gave her a job where she's been faithful to the Lord in winning souls. And and the kingdom work has expanded because of Carol's dedication, not just doing the physical work here, but being the person as she is, as God has grown her and as he has changed her, uh, people have been at, attracted to Jesus because of her. And so we thank the Lord for that. And I know that God will bless you, but I'd like to ask God's blessing on this offering that you're going to give and that God will tell you exactly what to give and we're going to ask then Howard to come and say a blessing over Carol. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pause to be thankful for all the gifts that you've given to us. We cannot give to you what you first have given to us, so we give it joyfully. And today's love offering for Carol, we give it in your name. And we could never repay what she has done for your kingdom and for the church here. But you will supply her needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And you've have, you will have happy surprises for her. And Lord, I know that you love her very much and she loves you too. So Lord, we thank you for the gift that Carol has brought to this church and the gift of her life. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Howard and Carol. Let us stand and stretch our hands to Carol. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for our sister in Christ, for she has done many, many things and is being available to you. Keep her eyes, let her keep her eyes upon you and your will, where she will have your peace, your protection, and provision. May your face shine upon her and give her special blessings throughout her life, Lord. And just surround her with your protection and keep her safe and in good health. We just thank you for her life. And now special blessing is upon her. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.
certainly give thanks to the Lord for all of his blessings. At this time, I'd like to have a short prayer for our shut-ins who cannot come and who haven't been coming. And I know that many of them are watching by Facebook. We don't want them to think that we've forgotten them. And one who lives at Rosalani lost her husband during this pandemic. And so we want to especially pray for Donna that God will comfort her and strengthen her. But let's remember our shut-ins at this time. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you because we know that you're the giver of life. You're the giver of strength. You provide all of our needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So we pray for our shut-ins, Lord, who have not been able to come to service. We pray that you'll fill their place with your holy healing presence that you will be their strength, that you will be their portion, that you will supply whatever they need, especially in companionship at this time. Let them know that you will never leave them nor forsake them, that you're there with them, and all they have to do is talk to you wherever they are. Father, we thank you for them. They've been the faithful ones of our congregation, and so we pray blessings on them on this Thanksgiving Day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. How can I say thanks for the things? you have done for me things so undeserved yet you give to prove your love for me the voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude all that I am and ever hope to be I owe it all to thee to God be the glory to God be the glory to God be the glory for the thing With his blood, he has saved me. With his power, he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Just let me live my life. Let it be pleasing, Lord, to Thee. And should I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. With His blood, He has saved me. With His power, He has raised me. To God be the glory for the things He has done. I'd like for you to turn with me. Oh, I see they switched the program. We'll have the worship songs now. God bless you. I've had a morning of running around, sorry. But uh, let's worship the Lord. I feel like your hearts will be ready for the message if we worship the Lord together. So let's praise the Lord and sing it unto him. Amen. Father, we praise you. Lord, we praise you. We praise you. 
Amen. Amen. Isn't it great that we can come in the house of God, not only on Thanksgiving Day, but every time he calls us to assemble, he's here with us, the Almighty God. I want you to now turn with me to John chapter 8. And of course, on Thanksgiving, we have many things to reflect about our great nation. And I think what we've forgotten and we're becoming kind of um, lethargic in our activity concerning carrying on the heritage that God has given to us as a country, we need to be reminded that the America that we know today and the foundations upon which our great nation have been built started with, really, 51 people. This is the 400th anniversary of the landing of the 51 pilgrims on Plymouth Rock. I've been there. They show us that that's the rock, but, you know, after 300 years, I don't know if that's the same rock. But we touched it, and you know how tourists do, we took pictures. But it's there, in Plymouth, Massachusetts. From the 51 who landed and settled there, 10% of Americans are descendants from those pilgrims. 30 million Americans are descendants of the 51 who first came in 1620. They're fleeing religious persecution after King Henry VIII, you know, that famous one that had many wives. He separated from the Catholic Church, which was a church that England had at that time as an official church, because they did not allow his divorce. And he did not allow diversity of religion. They had their form. It's called the Anglican Church. And they have similar rituals as the Catholics, many of them. But the things that they took out of the Catholic Church and made their own were not really what people who really believed in the Bible felt like was right. And so this group of pilgrims went not directly to America, but they went to Holland, and they tried to settle there, but they're afraid that their children were assimilating into that culture and that religion and would forget England. And so somehow by the providence of God, God led them to come and settle in this new land. Jamestown in Virginia had already been settled in 1607. And so they headed, they thought they would settle north of Jamestown in Virginia, but the currents and the winds took them farther north, and they landed in Plymouth, Massachusetts. They then decided that they needed a way of conducting themselves. They wrote a creed of conduct, of a new form of government, the first of its kind, that it would be of the people, for the people, and by the people, under God. Do you know that our form of government is unique? Do you know why there are millions of people who are trying to get in? Because there is no place on earth except if they followed our form of government in certain countries. It usually was up to that time that the king ruled and the king made his orders and everybody obeyed, had to obey. But this new concept based in the Bible, where God teaches the value of every individual person, they based this government that had never been thought of before to be one that would be of the people, by the people, for the people, and the people will elect their leaders. And then, of course, we've come to this form of government of, uh, having the term of office and so forth. But they drew up what we call the Mayflower Compact, and it's the principles that our Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were drafted from over 150 years after the Mayflower Compact. Because of it, we are the freest people on earth. Except for those who receive Christ. And in this eighth chapter of John, Jesus had begun his ministry. And if you look at the first part of that chapter, it begins with Jesus 
setting the adulterous woman free. Now, I've been to foreign countries where a lot of times what we call prostitution was not the choice of the girl. Maybe their family was poor and so the, her parents allowed her to do that. But as in our modern times too, some of them were kidnapped and sold. And so it was not their choice. And so Jesus was looking down at the religious people who had gathered and who had been interrogating him and wondering, who are you? What are you doing? How do you relate to us? What does your life mean to us? And they were testing him whether, because he was Jewish, if they would keep the Mosaic law. And so they grabbed this prostitute and threw her at Jesus' feet. And they said, this woman has been caught in the very act of adultery. Uh, excuse me, I always say this. Um, how can a woman commit adultery without a man? Maybe it's a new thing, but it was old then. And Jesus, in his wisdom, did not say a word. Do you know that you can be very wise if you don't say anything right off and you think about it and let the Holy Spirit give you the word? I teach people here, be a good listener. When somebody comes with their problem, don't try to give them the answer right off. Let them tell their story. And then while you're listening to what they're saying, what is happening to them in their life, you're also listening with your spiritual ear to hear from God what he would tell them. So you're like a conduit. You're in between. And never give advice unless you know how to connect like that. It could be dangerous in interfering some, into somebody's life without hearing from God and just telling people out of your own knowledge, your own experience, well, you know, I feel like you should do that, or, you know, I experienced that and you shouldn't do that. It's very dangerous. It doesn't matter what you've seen, heard, or experienced. If somebody wants to have guidance and counseling, you need to, if you are not willing to do that, don't do it. Send them to somebody else who's willing, but listen to their heart. Because a lot of times we're talking about communication on Sunday night with our spouses or our spouses-to-be, and we want to have the right things said. But a lot of times people use words that they don't really mean. When they're hurting, they say things that they don't really mean. It's not coming from their heart. It's coming from their hurt. And so if you're in tune with God, you will hear what God is hearing. And so even if they may be asking you another question, you will answer the hurt that's in their heart that God wants to heal. And so this adulterous woman was cast at Jesus' feet, and Jesus didn't say anything. And he said this finally. He says, let him who hath no sin cast the first stone. Wonderful principle, I think, that should be practiced even today. If you don't have any sin, then you cast the first stone. We're so anxious sometimes as carnal Christians or people that want to accuse and we know the surface information and we want to throw stones. Let me say this, in church we don't throw stones because we are all sinners. And we know that we have no right to cast the first stone. So I, find, I hope that people that come in will find that forgiveness because we too have been forgiven. What did Jesus say to the adulteress and after all of them had left? I imagine one of them might have been guilty or several of them might have been guilty of the past years. So they slinked away. Nobody could cast that stone and Jesus found her. I love this story because it gives us a picture of the worth of a woman. Don't let the rhetoric of today's news tell us that masculinity is a disease and women have a right to do this or that. Did you know that that is what people are promoting? Political parties are promoting? Go look up the, Maui, uh, the American Medical Society's thing on masculinity and they'll give you a cure for masculinity. We don't have to have a right to be a full woman. We can be a free woman. 
And I love this story because it tells us how God sees us women. We can be cast down, we can be abused, we can be treated as nothing by the world. But Jesus will pick you up if you look to him. Where are your accusers? I don't know. And he says this, should, that should be comforting to every sinner, male or female. Neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. Do not take the forgiveness of your sins lightly. It is a responsibility after we're saved to live worthy from that on of the love of Jesus, to prove to him, not only on Thanksgiving Day, but every day after our salvation, that we are thankful that he saved us. And we will live worthy of that sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by the stripes that he bore, we are healed. We are made whole. Your wholeness, your new life, cost God something. It was free to us, but it cost God everything. As Christ took the penalty for our sins so that we could be free. And then in verse 12, right after that, he says, I am the light of the world. You'll find a lot of I am's in the Gospel of John. I think the first time God called his name that we know of, I, I am, is when Moses was called. When he saw that burning bush and he was out in the wilderness, in the desert, he had run away from Egypt because he had killed somebody. If you think all of these heroes of the Bible were saints, you read them and you're going to feel a lot, a lot better because some of them were murderers, they were cheats, they were deceivers, uh, they were adulterers, you know. So we all qualify because we see the love of God completing their life. But when Moses was called to go back to Egypt and to go free the children of Israel, he said, how can I go? I've been living out here for 40 years. They won't know me. I hope they won't know me when I go back because I'm a runaway murderer. And then God continued to press on him. Listen, some of us are running away and making excuses about doing what God wants us to do. But don't run away. God will still be with us and he will press us. And finally, Moses said, okay, I'm really willing to go. You know, I cannot speak. God says, I'll send your brother to speak for you. He made all kinds of excuses. Have you made excuses to God? You're asked to do something. Oh, I cannot do this. I'm not capable and so forth. And so finally Moses was convinced that he should go. And he said, well, when I go back, because he had to go to the fair, the top. And usually when they make deals, the emissaries from the country send their best to go and, and visit the king and whatever to request what they want. And so he said, who shall I say sent me? And God said, Tell them, I am sent you. God's name is I am. When Jesus came, he says, I'm the bread of life. Here he says, I am the light of the world. In other places in John, he says, I am the resurrection. I'm life. In John 14, 6, which we like to quote, he says, I am the way, the truth, the life. I mean, kind of covers everything. Jesus meets all of our needs. He is the way. If you're lost, he is the way to the Father. If you're looking for truth, and, and I, you know, I don't even turn on the news now because of what's going on, because I don't know who is telling the truth. You listen to one channel, and you, you're convinced that they know the truth, and they're reflecting the truth. And then you turn to another news channel, and they're saying the opposite, and they sound like they're telling the truth. So it's hard to discern, and that's why there's a lot of confusion. There was confusion at the trial of Jesus when he stood before Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate wanted to know the truth. He did not know that truth was staring him right in the eyes because Jesus says, I am the truth. I am the way. 
I'm the truth. You want truth? Go to the word of God. Don't ask for opinions. Go directly to the word of God. He will guide you. He will just, just meet your need. You'll be amazed that it confirms what it says of itself. The word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. It will speak to your need. You're going to find a scripture that speaks directly. We, we call it the rhema word, the anointed word that jumps out of these pages to answer your need. And then he says, I am life. Looking for life? You want to live longer? You want to live eternally? I am said, you can have it. Because he purchased your right to have an abundant life here and eternal life after your life here is over. He says, I am the resurrection and life. He that believeth me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. In this 12th verse, he simply says, I am the light of the world. He who believes me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus is everything. Father, there's some that don't know you who are listening. They're looking for help. They're looking for truth. They want life. They're lost. Holy Spirit, go out after them. Let it be rhema to them, your dealings today, to convict them on this Thanksgiving day that if they should de die today, they will not go to heaven unless they confess their sins and go by the way of Jesus' death and resurrection. Save people today, Lord. Save people today. And if you're ready to get saved, you just simply say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of all my sins. I've made a mess of my life. I need hope. Thank you for dying on the cross and taking the penalty of my sins for me. Thank you for purchasing eternal life for me. Thank you for giving me new life. I invite you to come in and be the Lord of my life. I give myself to you completely, Lord. I give myself to you. Amen. And Father, if there's anyone here who sincerely said that simple prayer, I pray that the burden of their sin will be lifted right now and the power of your Holy Spirit will come into them, that they will know that they've been born again, they've been passed from death unto life, and their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Seal it, Lord. With your precious blood, it's sealed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you. We thank you. We praise you. Jesus is the light. People are in darkness. Why do they do crazy things and think they're happy? Because they're in darkness. In John 3, 16, after it says the golden text, it said, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So Jesus comes in at light and we can either accept him and leave the light on or turn the light off and continue our dirty work. But Jesus has come to expose us. Don't be ashamed or embarrassed when he exposes you. You're going to be glad in glory when, when you know that he exposed it, not to shame you, but to rescue you so he can give you a better life. You know, because of the pandemic, we have had the Facebook. And because of the Facebook, we have been set free. We have set free a lot of people who are now walking in light. And if you're one of those that through our Facebook ministry, you've come to know the Lord, I'd like to pause and say a prayer of thanksgiving for you. And I want you to thank the Lord for saving you. Father, we thank you for the many now who have received Jesus as their personal savior and received life. Many of them have broken off from their sinful ways and they're trusting you. Many are trusting you for a spouse. And I'm praying that you're going to fill that need soon for each one who wants to give you their lives completely. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving them. 
And I hear, Lord, in the spirit, many who are thanking you that if it were not for this pandemic, if it were not for the ministry of this Facebook, they would still be lost and bound in their sin. Thank you for setting them free. We praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Jesus loves to look for sinners and find them. He knows that we're all lost. All we like sheep have gone astray. In the 31st verse of this 8th chapter, the religious leaders were now arguing with Jesus. You know when you're guilty and somebody finds you guilty, you, you kind of like want to fight back, kind of cover up your sin? Well, the religious leaders had been found out of their hypocrisy, and, and so they were bombarding him. And he says to them in the 31st verse, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Talk about freedom. You can be living as I know some Christians are in the worst political condition when all other religions except one, perhaps, are banned. And especially Christianity has been banned in so many countries, and there's darkness. And there's not the freedom that we have in America where we can assemble at any time so far. We have the freedom of religion, that freedom that the pilgrims base our country on. Did you know that is the freedom that they sought, that one freedom that they could worship God in any way they wanted to, go back to the Bible, study the Bible, and build their life in government. They did not know that it would turn out to be this great America. For 150 years, people in America lived very simply without really a government of their own. They were tied in still to England and other places. But the resolve of these who came for religious freedom planted something. Why are we fighting for our Constitution? Why are we fighting for God to be put back in schools and public places? Why are we fighting that churches, even during this pandemic, be given the freedom to worship. Do you know in California, at one point, I don't know if they changed, but you could not even sing because they said your spit would spread. Sorry. You know what I mean. Your spray would spread and might cause this. Why? Because the spirit of darkness wants to overtake the light that Jesus is. And we need to keep guard. We are the generation. Those of us who are alive right now, need to be soldiers to preserve the religious freedom that our nation was founded on. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Now, a lot of times we don't want to be told the truth. We pray that people will be kinder and not tell us the truth. But truth will set us free. What is the truth? In Romans 3.23, it says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. What is the truth? Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. What is the truth? In 1 John 1.9 it says, if you will confess your sins, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What is the truth? Roman Revelation 3.20 says, behold, Jesus is saying, I stand at your heart's door and knock. He's a gentleman. He won't come bursting in your house. He wants to be invited. I stand at your heart's door and knock. If you open the door, 
then I'll come in and have fellowship with you. These are the truths that can set you free. Are you free indeed? You can be, as I said, in the worst country in the world. There are Christians who've been free in spirit. They're living in China and in other places of persecution. And yet they're free, even as they have to hide to worship, because they're free in Jesus Christ. The religious leaders had said to Jesus, what are you talking about freedom? We have never been slaves. They had forgotten that Moses was called to release them from their slavery for over 400 years in Egypt. They forgot that. How easily we forget the bondage that we were in. And Galatians says, don't go back to your bondage. You've been set free. Don't go back like a dog goes back to its vomit. Not in Galatians, but in somewhere you say that, you know, when you backslide, that's what you're doing. Jesus' answer was in the 34th to the 36th verse. Most assuredly, I say to you, who co whoever commits sin is slave to sin. If you're still sinning, if you take falling off the wagon, you know, I'll, I have this thrown back at me a lot of times. Well, I just fall off the wagon. Let me tell you what. Jesus paid for you to get back on. Don't take it lightly. He's merciful and kind, gracious and loving. He's not willing that any should perish and go to hell, but that all should come to repentance. He came all the way from heaven to rescue you. Don't take it lightly. I pray that every time you make a mistake and fall off the wagon or something, that it will pierce your heart. It will bring you to tears. It will bring you to repentance because mercy operates with repentance. If you do not repent, then there's judgment ultimately at the end. But there's also judgment over your life. You are not going to be free to enjoy the kind of life God has for you. You, in your sin, entangle yourself with the bondages that Jesus came to set you free. Just think about it. If you've not made up your mind, whatever problem you've had, whatever difficulty you've had, I think you will realize that you've made your own bondage by not obeying the Lord. And then it says here, a slave does not abide in the house forever. Therefore, if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. Amen. Are you free this morning? When we celebrate Thanksgiving, I want us to be grateful around your lunch or whatever you're having with your family. Thank God for America, the freedom that we have. This is why you see thousands, if not millions, of people risking their lives so they can come into our country and be free to be anything they want to be if they're willing to work. I want to be thankful, too, next, for my salvation. Many of you were bound with your sin. Your sin made you miserable. And until you heard about Jesus, you didn't think you could ever get out. And then Jesus came. Your eyes were open. You made a decision to follow Jesus. And when you did, he set you free. So around your Thanksgiving dinner, take time as a family to thank God for the freedom. Some of you, Last Thanksgiving, you were not as free as you are this Thanksgiving because you came to know Jesus as your own personal Savior. So celebrate that. Let's bow our heads in prayer. While we're in the sanctuary, could you give an offering of thanksgiving to the Lord and say where you are? Thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me just the way I am. Thank you for accepting me, even if I'm not yet perfected. Lord, thank you. Thank you for seeing some worth in me. Thank you for giving me life and hope. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you.
glorify you. We bless you. We thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we do thank you for just allowing us to be a part of your family. That as our Father, you never forget us. And all we have to do is run to you through Jesus Christ, our Savior, and find help. Bless the hurting, Lord. Bless the needy, Lord. Help them to take you at your word so you can supply all their need according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on our country and our family and ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand, and I'm going to ask James to come up, and let's sing the doxology. You know, in our church, before we eat, even in, in the restaurants, we join in singing the doxology, a doxology of blessing. And so some of you are going to have, and maybe already eating your uh, Thanksgiving dinner, but let's all stand and sing that together as you get dismissed. Those of you here, pick up your Thanksgiving dinner before you go, and uh, if we, you need to take some extras, maybe for somebody that needs around your neighborhood, see Carol, and they will help you do that, but let's end with the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. May the Lord bless you and keep you and let His face shine about you a blessing to those around you who will be around your table and I pray that you will acknowledge the presence of God wherever you go. Amen. God bless you. I love you all. We cannot be together but know that in spirit we are so have a great day tonight. Come back and we're going to have a wonderful service. Our lesson oh tonight we don't have services that's Sunday. Okay Thanksgiving be with your family tomorrow night we don't have Facebook but Sunday morning we'll be back here, and then Sunday night we will continue our lesson on marriage and the family. God bless you. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Love you. Bye.